Maritato, no mai, haere mai, and welcome along to Showy Overs to a recording being done in Te Wiki o Te Reo Māori, Māori Language Week. Now, I am no Reo expert, but I really am finding it quite magical to hear it being spoken so much more, particularly in just the past few years. And the more you learn, the more you recognise when it's been used in all settings, and therefore the more you feel connected to what it is to be from Aotearoa, I think. So, nā mihi nui ki te katoa, a big thanks to everyone who presented the Māori language petition 50 years ago that started this ball rolling. Slowly at first, but now really gaining great speed. But... As I said, welcome to Showy Ovaries, a podcast where I, peeking over the precipice of perimenopause, Penny Ashen, try to plunder the life experience of various guests so I can possibly be prepared for what prickly predicaments might transpire and continue to alliterate the letter P far too much. As always, a quick reminder that I am not a doctor, but here is some terrible doctor jokes I sourced from the internet. One, why did the Dalmatian go to the eye doctor? He kept seeing spots. Hilarious. Two, I told the doctor that I broke my arm in two places. She told me to stop going to those places. Three, the last one, and I think this one's the best. You can laugh out loud if you like. Um, How did the doctor cure the invisible man? He took him to the ICU. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I know, I'm so dumb. Anyway, Today's guest, patiently listening to all of this nonsense, may not be a doctor, but in my continuing series of social media superstars in the menopause space, she is the founder of the very popular Menopause Over Martinis Facebook group, and has no doubt educated thousands of ladies and trans individuals about their bodies and menopause potentials. Sarah Connor not only kicks the asses of futuristic terminators, but she also kicks the asses of stigma, shame, and misinformation around menopause. On her website, she describes herself as someone who writes and edits content and copy for good sorts. She's a storyteller and writer in the PR space, but only for products and services she feels passionately about. Things that enlighten, empower, or inspire positive change. She edits, proofreads, writes opinion pieces, presents on menopause to businesses, etc., and is a dedicated moderator on the very busy Facebook group, which now has 2,518 members. Her tasks include fielding questions and chats from me at all times of the day, <laughs> despite never having actually met in person. So she's beaming into my office from Poneki, Wellington. I am sounding sexily husky today due to going out last night to see not one, not two, not three, but four different shows, uh, as if it were the before days. But anyway, please welcome Menopause social media maven, Sarah Connor. Hello, kia ora. Hello, Morena. Thank Morena. you for having me. No worries. Thanks for coming along. How are you doing? I am going very well, thank you. It's a beautiful sunny day with no wind in Wellington. I that know. is something to celebrate. It's really, do you know what? Wellington, I love coming to Wellington. Wellington turns out for shows, but the weather kills me. I just couldn't yeah. do it. So I think that you're a very resilient person for living in Wellington. I think it keeps us alive. Wow. It's a challenge. Yeah, it's a it's challenge. Like, it's a daily yeah. challenge when you walk in at yeah. an, an angle into the wind. I know because yeah. Wellington is so great. Like it, it, the cafes, the culture, it's pretty. That harbour's gorgeous. But then, yeah, I just, anyway. And then there's the people. I just of, keep well, meeting good yes, people. Of course. And they really yeah. do support the arts. Like I'm about oh. to do a month at Circa. There's no way I could do that in Auckland. Amazing. Yeah. 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 I love Circa. Circa is my second home. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you wrote a really nice post about Te Wiki o Te Reo Māori. So would you like to just tell us a little bit about what you said? Yes. So the word for menopause in Te Reo Māori is rohenitanga. And as I've been learning about menopause and exploring what menopause means and how it's perceived in different cultures, of course, learning about it in Te Reo Māori was one of the first places that I uh, learned it. So, Rohini Tang means menopause. Rohini as a word, it's actually the name of the mountain range I grew up with and was the horizon of my childhood, which is amazing that I had no idea that yeah. that's what Rohini meant. Yeah, that's really sort of cyclical in a very sort of yeah. poetic way, isn't it? And massively missed opportunity had I known about that sooner. Well, we didn't know anything about all that. <laughs> no, we didn't. And Rohini, as I understand it, means the process of growing older for a woman. It also means a woman of importance. So it's a verb, it's a noun. And I just think what a beautiful thing that is so much more beautiful than the word menopause, which is Greek, which means the stopping of periods. I mean, yeah. Nuruhinitanga sounds like a much 
better idea with a lot more money. It really appeals. You went, when I interviewed Jennifer Ward Leland and she was telling me about various words like Fenua is the, yes. the land, but it's also the placenta. Placenta, yeah. Yeah, so that's like it is like this poetic sort of metaphorical language that way, which is what you will yeah. unlock if you learn more, et cetera. So, yeah. yeah, that's so interesting that it was your horizon, yes. you know, like what sort yes. of, yeah, looking towards. Yeah. And, and yet here we are. And so, just yeah. on the language thing, I mean, my children are growing up learning today, which is a beautiful thing. They yeah. learn it at school, they come home, they sing it in our house, they teach us things, amazing. The only language options for me when I was at school were French and German. Yeah, ich so, auch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I learned German because I liked the teacher. She'd actually lived in Germany, which was quite novel. Same with mine. I, and good. interestingly, I had heard the word for menopause in German spoken in Germany before I heard it spoken in English in wow. my own country, which I find strange. And what is it in um, German? Defexiliara, which means the years of change or the changing years. Again, yeah. far more useful than the stopping of periods. I remember, yeah, you because know, I read that that you were talking about, and that is that German habit. Like my favorite word in German is Handschuhe for gloves. gloves. So like hand shoes. These are my hand shoes. <laughs> I, I know. That. And that's why I loved learning German and was probably quite good at it because once you'd learned the little words, you just jam them all together to get big words. And it was really right. easy to translate the big words if you knew the little words. Yeah, I went to so, Germany on exchange when mm. I was 16. And actually, mm. I went, like, I don't even know. It was like only a couple of weeks after I had my first epileptic seizure. I was off wow. around the world. My mother was freaking out. And the host family were freaking out too, really. And I was freaking out. But I, I, I've always loved Europe for some reason. I needed mm. to go to Europe. Mm. And so I loved being in Germany. But, yeah, mm. it was quite a tumultuous time. I bet. Yeah. I bet. yeah. And I started taking my meds and that's when I started to put on weight. So this is the thing about oh. like with me not realizing it was the meds that were doing it. It was because I was in Germany for two months, you know, eating strudel and Freedom. sausage and pretzels. Yeah, exactly. So then I thought, well, that, that quite big weight gain just over those two months was just that. So it was like, yeah. it was all these timed with these things or like being 16. So everyone's like, oh, it's puppy fat, you know, et yeah. cetera. But it's actually yeah. medical. Yes. Mm. So that was a fun document. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. Anyway, we look back on these things now with, with amusement and stuff like that. But how is yeah. the menopause over martinis Facebook group going? Well, it's growing, isn't it? Yeah. It's growing and it's Yeah, you've been mentioned in all these books, which is fantastic, like both Nikki Pellegrino and Nikki Bizant. So has that given you a big really big helpful boost? I think so, yeah. 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 yeah, because I guess everyone who goes to the library, borrows the book or buys the book or listens to the book, comes across my name and what I'm doing and – the group and the website and the idea of people coming together over dinner and so I guess yeah yeah okay the more people read it the more people talk about it and the more people want to ask questions and be part of the community yeah absolutely yeah. it was funny because apparently Virginia Fallon has a piece in the paper today about why is no one talking about menopause and it almost feels like oh, oh we've been talking, we've about, been it. talking about it yeah <laughs> A couple of years. Yeah. For, it's like, yeah, I think you'd be, it would be quite surprising to find people that haven't noticed the, the, the uptick in this. So I thought that was it. But of course, yeah. it's happening to her now. Ah. So now she was talking about it as, you know, as the thing. But anyway, I'll get to my normal questions and then we yes. will jump around to your particular takes on them. So first question is, what has your journey with your body been like through your life and, and what, what has been that process? Well, I think I've had a good relationship with my body. Great. It's been positive. Uh, we've been together a long time. Yeah. So we're pretty close. Oh, How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 50. 50, right. Proudly 50. Woohoo. Big, fat, round number. Really like it. Did you have a party? It was sort of tricky with COVID. Of course, yes. I didn't really want to have a super spreader party, but I'm actually someone who likes to have a lot of smaller parties. Yeah, gatherings. that makes sense. How perfect. So it was really nice. It was um, over a month. I just had dinners and drinks and you know, gatherings that's, and that's actually genius because you know when yeah. you have a big party you're always like I didn't get to talk to everybody exactly yeah, yeah. so yeah. I had okay. something with my family I had something with friends did all sorts of things hmm. yeah it was great hmm. Hmm. so um back to my body back to my relationship with my body yes it's been good I mean like any relationship there are ups and downs but I would say I've been fit and healthy and well so I feel quite blessed that my body hmm. has worked for me hmm. And that I've liked my body. And that you, it's given you children and... It's given me children, yes, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know what else really there is to say on that. Wow. You know, it's so interesting, the, the change, like, you know, some people are like, how long have you got? Um, how long is this podcast, et cetera? <laughs> and then, you know, like, and it's just so interesting to me that that absolute gamut of experience around the body. Yeah. And like what it's perceived as supposed to be and therefore when you don't fall into that, but then you felt like you were 
you know, you just you just appreciate it for what it gave you and yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I hear from people who say that there's a certain amount of grief that can come from going into perimenopause or menopause because you can no longer have children. And I guess because I'd had children and I didn't want to have more children, I didn't have that feeling. Yeah. And um, I have never wanted children. So yes. that so you know, I almost wish that it well, apart from the associated crap that comes with it, I would have liked to have to happened earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you go. Yeah. There you go. So it was quite a surprise having been fit and happy and healthy and well. It was quite a surprise to go into perimenopause and suddenly realise that my body didn't work. Yeah. Like I had always expected it to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because because we haven't been pre-warned. So, so did you know anything about menopause? No. I mean, I knew the word, but mm. I didn't understand it as a hormonal transition and that it was a normal, inevitable stage of life. I thought that it meant sometime in my 50s or 60s that my periods would suddenly just stop yeah so I would just miss one and then it just wouldn't I just wouldn't have my period again right and I imagined my mum at some point getting a bit hot and I don't know if it was just because it was summer and she was cooking a roast or if she was having a hot flush but she was just in the kitchen sweating you know like using her hands to kind of fan her face saying and throwing off her cardigan and saying is it hot in here or is it just me right and in hindsight, she may well have been having a hot flush or a series of hot flushes. I don't know. Is she not here anymore? No, Sorry. she's still alive. My mum's still alive. Asked her. But I've asked her, yeah. and she doesn't remember. Do you know? Oh my god, this is like because I was thinking about people to interview when I first started this, and my mother has these walking groups of mm. women in their seventies, eighties, and I was like, oh, can mm. we get together and talk about it? And they were all, oh, I can't remember that. Oh, that was so long ago. And to me, I don't know, because I my experience coming to menopause was that my friend nearly bled out from lack yeah. of blood. So I'm like, how did, how did, what do you mean you don't, re-, you know? So, yes, mm. it, it's fascinating that yes. they don't remember at all. Yeah. yeah, and I wondered, do they not remember because it wasn't talked about and to make a memory you actually have to talk about it, acknowledge it, experience it and sort of log it and mm. therefore it's not remembered. Or maybe they just had quite an easy time. That seems to be the thing that I would conclude. Yes, it would be great if that was the case. Yeah. But I don't know if that was the case. Yeah, especially because you haven't had such an easy time and they say you often mm. marry your mother. So mm. that's fascinating, isn't it? Like, you it know, is. here we are mired in it and she's like, oh, I can't remember. <laughs> it's hard for me to remember, uh, to, for me to think that I might rem- not, you know, forget, forget this. The, the stage. It's a yes. significant um, stage in my life, which has mm. been, started out being really challenging and is now is super rewarding and quite amazing to think what I'm doing. And yes, I don't think you'll work. forget your Facebook group with two and a half thousand people and things like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Quite an interesting no. one to stop thinking and about. And the fact that I'm someone who usually, as a writer, is behind the scenes telling the stories and writing words for the purpose of other people to promote what they're doing, not something that I truly believe in and want to shout out to everybody in my path. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. Um, so and was your mum good about body stuff in general? She was good in that there was definitely no negative stuff. So I, it wasn't until I started the Facebook group actually and started talking to other people about all the kind of negative connotations that were around this topic. One of the silver linings, I guess, of growing up knowing nothing about it was that I didn't have any of that baggage. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that I was meant to become invisible or not as valuable. I didn't know that I was meant to feel less productive because wow. it, it just never been in my consciousness but it's in the it's in society so did you just manage to well, it is, out? but I just didn't really relate to it yeah I just didn't really connect I just didn't relate that stuff that people were talking about with me maybe it's because I'm in the performing arts that I've heard this invisible thing for a long time yeah you know and yeah. I I get very sick of the infantilizing of the elderly you know like then suddenly they're going to be like oh how are you dear you know like it's yeah. like if somebody starts talking to me like that I'll be like you can fuck off yeah yeah I'm grateful to my mum that i while it would have been nice to have had a little bit of information, the upside was that I it was sort of neutral. Like I just didn't have negative stuff to think about. Yeah, and it's amazing if your mum wasn't she was she she was never negative about her own body. No, not until she was probably older and probably in midlife and older. Right, I would say. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. not growing, not as certainly not when I was younger. And I didn't have. Yeah, and mine did. didn't have that visual. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny, like, yeah. I've never really thought about that so much. I talk about it with other people all the time. But, yeah, that mum mm. – and also my, it was my dad, really. My dad's constantly judge, – judges all women by their figure. Oh. You know, like, oh, that, that woman, oh, yeah, she's got a good figure. That woman, oh, you know, and all this sort of stuff the whole time. Right, and it's, yeah. And it's just so deeply – Well, unhelpful. Patriarchal. Yeah. And awful. Yeah. Shut up, Dad. Right. So then how did it start to manifest itself in you? 
It was out of the blue, really. I was just uh, going along like usual and was driving home one day from the middle of Wellington up Mount Victoria, which is quite steep and winding, and suddenly felt really hot and faint and like I might faint while I was driving, which was Jesus frightening. Confronting, yep. And I sort of could feel my eyes closing and thinking, I, I remember saying to myself, I can't faint now because I'm driving a car. And even though I was going slowly and there was nothing behind me and there was nothing coming, I just thought it didn't look like like a good thing so somehow I managed to keep my eyes open and just pull over and stop and I just felt like my brain was melting from the inside out like it Holy was a shit. full like maybe I haven't had another hot flush if it was a hot flush I don't know if it was a hot flush but if it was I don't know if that's normal but just it passed within like seconds right but it really shook me obviously yeah. and I thought what the hell so fortunately I was quite close to home and my partner came down and you know we went home and I went off to see a GP and my usual GP wasn't available. So I saw an, an older guy who was a locum. And he was the first person I heard say the word perimenopause. But having said that, I just kind of wrote it off as, well, I don't know what that means, but it sounds like something that happens when I'm older. And so I just didn't really think about it much. And how old were you at that stage? I was 46. Right. Yeah. In hindsight, I had had irregular periods for probably about a year, but they weren't super irregular. They were kind mm. of might be a week early or a week late but not enough for me to think that anything was really changing yeah and because like I said I thought periods would just stop and then not come back I didn't join the dots so I just went on my way and didn't have any other incidents like that and then over the summer it was sort of you know Christmas time and then over the summer started to have this pile up of symptoms where I felt like I wasn't sleeping I was waking in the night or not being able to go to sleep which was really unusual for me Mm. I've been the world's best sleeper I started to have these waves of anxiety, physiological anxiety, not related to anything I was thinking about, nothing I was doing at the time. It just sort of came upon me. So just like palpitations? Not really that. It was just feeling this nervous kind of energy and sort of slightly tingly fingers. Sometimes I'd feel like tingling in my face. Right. And that led to a couple of panic attacks. Right. Which I'd never had in my life. Didn't really know what that was. Mm. Ended up at A&E one night. Ended up with a paramedic at home one night. Wow. Had a weird sort of sensation like ants crawling under my skin, which has a special name called formication. Wow. Yeah. Has formica got something to do with ants? I think it's something to do. It's the origin of the word. I did look it up. I think it's Latin for maybe ant. Right. Okay. There's some connection to ants and that word. Right. Okay. And it was sort of up the back of my neck and my arms. I had a really low mood, so I could wake up after probably not a great night's sleep, and feel really flat, really low, no energy, no creativity, no joy, Mm. which was really confronting because I'm the opposite of those things. Mm. Didn't even really look forward to having breakfast, which is usually really exciting. (laughs) Yeah, I love breakfast. That would make me sad. Yeah. Made muesli. Yeah. (laughs) That's something to get excited about. (laughs) Um, Didn't really look forward to anything. Just felt really this odd feeling of nothingness. That's how I can, that's all I can describe. Right. It is. And yeah, that was quite confusing and quite worrying because I remember thinking, I'm only 46 and I'm going to live for a really long time, hopefully. And I don't really, can't really imagine living like that, you know, not really knowing Mm. how I'm going to feel, what I'm going to be able to do. So those were the kind of the main symptoms. I had a little bit of nausea. So at one point thought maybe I was pregnant, but I didn't want to be pregnant. So that wouldn't have been great. Mm. And I had this odd metallic taste in my mouth which wow. then I remembered that I'd had when I was pregnant. And I rang the GP once and the practice nurse said, oh, yeah, that's a really typical hormone, a sign of changing hormones. But none of these things that were being talked about were kind of joined up to make me think, I'm in perimenopause. Oh, well, right. Perimenopause. They were just all kind of individual things right. that I kept going back to my GP about and saying, well, now I've got this and now that's happening and now I'm feeling really flat and now I don't feel like I can go to work. And, you know, all these things were happening and it took three months and lots of things were explored where I was referred to a cardiologist in case it was my heart because I had low blood pressure. I was still feeling quite faint. Uh, I was referred to a counsellor because I had this anxiety. I saw a naturopath because I thought maybe I need to take some supplements and change my diet. I saw a hypnotherapist because I thought, well, that will help me manage the anxiety and help me get back to sleep, which is actually really useful. I learned heaps about using my breath and kind of meditating and listening to really beautiful but repetitive music to get back to sleep in the middle of the night. I learned heaps of stuff from all of those things, but none of them helped as much as when somebody said, I think this is hormonal. I think you're in perimenopause. I think you should see the menopause clinic. So not one, it took three, like, I'm sorry, yes. what's up with your GP? Have you got a new GP? 
No, but she's known me a long time and I really like her holistic approach in that she likes to rule out things. She was trying to rule out things that might be Yeah, that makes sense. Significant. Like my heart. Yeah, like and and this is the thing for me. Like I was saw I got a, an ECG ECG mm. recently because but I had pain that was moving all around my chest. And mm. I wasn't sure I about that. So yes. So that's that is definitely you want to make sure that you don't have blocked arteries, etc. Exactly. So I, I take it back. I take it back. But she never actually said it might be this. No, not all things are uh, menopause either. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I really respect that she was being thorough and exploring all kinds of things. Um, but it wasn't until I ended up not being able to make a, an appointment. Like I thought, actually, I just can't get to my appointment. And I was in tears. I, the other thing was that I was in tears, like, randomly. And so I just, after not a great sleep, was due to go to this appointment, was in tears and just rang and said, I can't make that appointment. And she then did a phone consult and you know, asked me some quite serious questions like, do you feel safe? I guess she was trying to get to the fact of, was I safe or did I feel like I could um, harm somebody else or myself? Oh, it's kind of a, there's a series of questions that doctors can ask you in a crisis situation. And that's when I thought, this is actually serious. Even though I didn't have thoughts that were really, you know, suicidal thoughts, I think that's what she was trying to ascertain. Right. And so I thought, okay, that's not what I'm thinking, but something has to change. This is not right. I'm not feeling myself. I can't really. I think I said to her, I can't go on just continuing to live like this. I need something. Mm. And at the same time, I had talked to older friends, so in their 60s and 70s, who said, oh, yeah, I had a bit of this, or I had a bit of that. Or have you read Beverly Lawton's book about menopause, which is now a much older book, but do you know about the Wellington Menopause Clinic? I said, never heard of it. Don't really know anything about that. So went off to the library, got the book, rang the clinic, said to my GP, I think I need to see someone. She said, yes, I think it's hormonal. And so finally, I got to where I needed to get to. And it was such a relief to have somebody say, these things are not typical of your health. These things are all very normal. I've seen many, many people in your situation and there are things that you can do to help. Yeah, and I mean, back to your GP. I mean, like she could have said, I suspect it's this, but let's rule this out. So then you had some sort of idea of what it Mm. might because that diagnosis thing is everything. So that must have mm. been a huge relief to you to get that diagnosis. Huge relief. Yeah, huge relief. I cried then as well. Yeah. With relief. Unsurprising. Yeah. yeah. So then yeah. you went to the menopause specialist doctor and yes. and was that Beverly Lawton or? Yeah, that was Beverly Lawton. Yeah. And she was amazing. Super. Did you cry in that, in that appointment? Yes. Well. Cried then. <laughs> yep. And you get a whole 40 minutes with a specialist. Well, I did. How much did it cost? Yeah. Unfortunately, the first appointment I think was about, Either 180 or $200. I can't remember. Oh, that's better than I thought it would be. Some are even more than that, yeah. I think. Yeah. But to sit down and go through your entire health history and exactly what's going on for you in that moment and over the past, you know, three months for me was just incredible. It was like getting into a warm bath and someone just saying it's going to be okay. And there are things that you can try, like HRT, which I did try. Mm. And mm. within days, weeks, months, just climbed out of this really dark place I was sleeping I got my appetite back there was another thing the anxiety just sort of cancelled my love of cooking and eating so suddenly I was sleeping eating feeling happy not crying um, and actually able to function wow yeah and then yeah probably after about six months I started to think yeah I'm I can do this right yeah so it took yeah. six months to come to a stasis, as it were. It's not a silver bullet, and it doesn't happen overnight because you have to sort of build up these levels, right, of the estrogen and the progesterone. So, yeah, over days, weeks, months, I would say, and by about six months, I thought, yeah, I can actually go out or I could actually take a plane somewhere or I could drive to see my family who are four hours away. There is, there's stuff that I thought, okay, I'm, I can now do those things. Wow. For how long hadn't you been able to do those things? I was a few months, so from January to April. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. That, yeah. So. Yeah. And very unfun. Very unfun. Right. And, and do you mind if I ask what dosages you're on? Sure. So the estrogen patches, the estradots, I started on the 50s and went up to the 75s after about two years, I think. Oh, yeah. I'm now in my third year. So about two years. And I hadn't appreciated, but this is a really good thing I think for people to know, is that the symptoms and all changes that might be going on at the beginning of perimenopause can change in the middle and towards the end or at any point along that time frame. And so I went back to, you know, I have an annual checkup with the menopause clinic and they explained this to me. And so I could just start to feel some of those symptoms coming back, not sleeping and the anxiety were the two key ones. 
and they said, look, let's just try this the slightly higher dose and see what happens, and it totally resolved it. And I've tried to go back to the 50s just to see where I'm at because that's the really the only way that you can tell if, is where you're at is to reduce it slowly over time. And back on the 50s, I'm waking in the night, I'm not sleeping solidly, and I get that kind of nervous right. energy out of nowhere. Yeah. Wow. Science, eh? Yeah. Then I take the progesterone capsules, which are the uterodestin, and I take those in the evening for two weeks of every month. Oh, okay. I take them at night because they help me sleep. They sort of make me feel sight. For some people, it makes you feel slightly sleepy, which is super handy. Yeah. And the reason I take them for two weeks of the month rather than continuously is because I was still getting periods when I started the HRT. And so the specialist said, you can continue to have a withdrawal bleed, which is, you know, the term for the kind of fake period every once a month. So I now get a regular, really light, short period. It's like a period. And I can choose at any point to go on the progesterone continuously and then I won't get a period. Right. Okay. So that's where I'm at on that. And this is the thing because that costs money. And how much does that cost you a month? Yeah. So for $5, I get the patches three months worth, which is pretty good. $5, yeah. cup of coffee. Thanks, Pharmac. I don't drink coffee, so it's quite a good deal. Right. But for the progesterone, that's the expensive thing that isn't funded yet, but apparently mm. I've heard that it could be soon. Oh, amazing. Yep. That is about $33 per month for me. Right. And that's only on a two week. Wow. I only need two weeks worth. But if someone was on more than that, that's yeah. quite, you know, that's significantly more. And this yeah. is the this is such the problem for the inequity mm. around it all, and just the woman that yeah. can't afford to even take time off, exactly, or exactly pay, or yeah, that's yeah. why we need to step up the GP training so much better because there's no reason for you to go to a menopause clinic. For that. Exactly, the yeah. menopause specialist even said to me, "This is something that a GP, if they were up with the latest plate, could yeah. be prescribing, and I wouldn't be paying the two hundred dollars to see her, mm. the specialist, and someone else could be seeing then. Yes, my, I think my GP is pretty good. Like she's offered it to me because I've got this ongoing vulva mm. pain issue that I haven't figured out. I've said this a lot, but my doctor is great. Like she really listens. Yeah. Um, yeah and in fact, she thanks me for because I've been educating her about mm. things, which has been amusing. Yeah. Has your GP? Yeah. Have you taught your GP about this? Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. Great. Totally. And it's not that she didn't know about it. I think she just. Wasn't initially up for the HRT conversation. I think he'd thought that I was too young, right. which isn't right. No. Because perimenopause can kick in any time from 40-something and for some people late in their late 30s. Yeah. And that's when the symptoms are often the most problematic. And so that is the time to actually try and ease those symptoms. Yeah, yeah. and the amount of people that are saying that you can't go on HRT when you have a period, which is also nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I still have my period. So – but I really like her. I really like her kind of holistic, thorough thinking. And we talk about it all the time. And she's really supportive of either prescribing me HRT if I go there and I need a new script or I have my annual checkup with the menopause clinic. So, yeah. Yeah, right. And so then how did menopause over martinis happen? Well, that happened because I wanted to celebrate feeling well again after a few yeah. months of feeling really unwell. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also realized that my friends didn't really understand what either they were going through or may go through because they were younger than me. And I'd also had a huge amount of support from talking to older women in my life, you know, in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and thought, we need to talk about this all together. Like I'd been going about doing my own research and talking to everybody in my path, but thought what a cool thing it would be to get all of those people together and actually just share what we all knew. And for people who didn't know much to be able to ask questions – so I hosted this dinner with eight of us around my dining room table and I called it menopause over martinis for fun and because I like a bit of alliteration. Like yes, you. indeed. <laughs> and I thought there was a bigger chance of people coming if I <laughs> had cocktails. Called it menopause over martinis than a menopause <laughs> over a cup of tea. I mean, there's nothing wrong with talking about menopause over a cup of tea, but I thought at dinner time, I just wanted to feel fun and celebratory and kind of up and a bit novel, I guess. Mm. <laughs> and the name also was a play on the idea of death over dinner. Do you know about death over dinner? So it's an idea that came from some counsellors, I think psychologists as well in the States, who realised that death was a, a taboo, something that we're not used to talking about, but it's really useful to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to happen. There's mm -hmm. no, way, no way out of it. I'm trying to get my dad to just sit down and go like, where do you want to be? Yeah. And he just is like, la, la, 
like he just doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah, well, like, what kind of be... funeral do you want? Like... Exactly. And so and it would just be so much easier for me to do stuff that I – well, we have recorded some songs to go at mm. his funeral. He's sung right. Little Old Wine Drinking Me, which is very apt, uh, and stuff like that. But, yeah, I just want to sit them down and just go, look, please write some stuff down and tell me. So, yes, anyway. So, yeah. so death, death over dinner is this idea that you come together with your friends or family at home or anywhere – and you talk about death and dying and wills and enduring powers of attorney and mm. everything that kind of comes with that stuff. And I had been to one and a guest at one and I had hosted one with my partner at home and they were the most hilarious and meaningful dinners that I've been to or hosted and right. we couldn't get people to leave. It was just people had so many stories and it was really cathartic too for a lot of people who hadn't actually dealt with a lot of stuff, grief, death. Yeah. I mean, I've been very fortunate. I have had so few deaths in my life. Yeah. Like I know it's yeah. a, something's about to give, but yeah. 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 And so when it came to menopause being a taboo as well and me realizing that no one's talking about this in my world and I need to, I've needed to talk about it for my own benefit. And I know that my friends are really grateful that I spoke to them about it. Let's just go with menopause over martinis and have a dinner and talk about another taboo. Yeah, so that's how it came about. And I was just planning to have one dinner. It was just, I, I emailed the invitation. I invited my friends. We had a fun night. We learned some stuff and everyone else, you know, everyone went home. And what year was that? More informed. That was three years ago. Uh -huh. And then the word got out that I'd had this dinner and then other friends said, oh, when you have the next one, can they come? And I said, oh, I wasn't, having, wasn't planning on another one. That was just a thing, a one-off thing. So then I hosted the second one and then I hosted the third one and then I thought this is not very sustainable because I can't host dinners every Saturday night and my I share my house with my family. Yeah, and yeah. that gets expensive too. Well, it's potluck, which is great. That's the mm. other best thing about it is that you don't have to do anything except set the table and make one dish. Right. And so after three dinners, it was about to be World Menopause Day 2020 and one of the friends who'd come as a guest to the third dinner said, I think you should just turn this into a thing. Because I was saying it would be great if other people hosted dinners and then I wouldn't have to. And so I thought, okay, well, I could build a website because I know about that. I can put the invitation online. I can share the facts and the figures that I wish I'd known sooner. I can add the books and the, all the stuff that I read and the articles I read and all those things in one place. And then just say to everybody, hey, here it is. You know, here's everything you need to start the conversation. It's easy. It's fun. It's potluck. You don't have to drink martinis. You can drink sparkling water. You can have a cup of tea if you want to. Um, and just people people can just do whatever they want with it. And so I launched that on World Menopause Day in 2020. And I spoke on Radio New Zealand. That published my personal essay about my experience. And then the person who had helped me with the website said, oh, you'll need to start a Facebook page. And I wasn't even on social media. I don't know. Oh. You know, I didn't know how Facebook worked. Really? Yeah. Wow. I had, I had an account that was just dormant. Right. And are you sad that you're not? Because <laughs> it's it can be very consuming, right? It can be. It can yeah. be. But you've got to go where the people are, she said. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why it's really, it's an invaluable tool for theatre. Advertising, yes, particularly on Facebook, you cannot get any of the same cut through to your immediate demographic for such a low amount of money. Than it kind of kills yeah. me because Facebook yeah. can be so evil and their customer service. Like I'm in the middle of still being banned and making events because I said that something was a chink in an armour and they decided that was hate speech. Oh. Um, so, yeah, that sort of stuff can drive you mad. Mm. But the cut through that you can get on social media, particularly of a, of a menopausal age group, that's like a really yes. big group that's on Facebook. Yeah, Mm. And one thing I was really deliberate about was to make it a public group. So most yes. groups are private groups. Yeah, yeah. And it was quite funny because I posted some stuff and I hadn't realised it was public yes. and I'd felt a bit embarrassed and about that. And I'm sorry that. about that. Well, mm. yeah, I mean, it was all there, but, like, I had just assumed yeah. it was private. So when, yeah. when my friend in America liked something about my <laughs> Volvo, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. But you can post anonymously, which is Yes, you can, which yeah. is great. Yeah. But I wanted it to be public because my whole co-papa is to make this conversation normal and – not taboo. Yeah. That's what I want to do. And I'm there and too, so, but I was like, oh, it's so funny too. I can talk about my Volvo with strangers more than people that you know. Yeah. Funny, is isn't it? So anyway, the group is there. It, it happened and now it's just growing. Yeah. Yeah. And what, and is it a lot of work? Like, do you feel like, you know, because you're not getting paid for this work? No, it really varies week to week. It just depends how many people are wanting to post things. You moderate it, hey? Yes, I do. And explain the reasons for that. The reason for that is that there is a lot of snake oil and pseudoscience yeah. and 
dare I say, crackpots who... On Facebook? No, never. Who want to sell their wares. And I'm not interested in that. Yeah. The purpose of the group is for people. I mean, it really started... We were in COVID times. I launched Menopause Over Martinis in the first year of COVID, expecting people to come together and have dinner. I mean, it's, you know, not great timing. But a Facebook group means that people can ask questions and can share information and keep the conversation going remotely. Mm. It wasn't set up to be a sales channel for people who want to sell their stuff. And do you get messages all of the time? All of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Or people trying to promote either their products or their services or their philosophies or their ideas or whatever. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because some of them are very valid and potentially very very good products. But how do you know? Yeah, that's Mm. right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Because I got Um, somebody emailing me saying, I've got your next podcast guest. She's amazing. And I was like, no, no, I'm fine. Oh, look, it's $200 a bottle for supplements, which, as Dr. Jerry McLeod says, are expensive wheeze. Yes. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Some people love them, though. Some people feel like they make a difference, and that's great. I tried magnesium. I tried melatonin. Melatonin didn't work for sleeping because that's, Mixed results from that. I wouldn't call that snake oil, melatonin for sleeping. No, no, it's not. Yeah. Mm, which is another hormone. Yeah, it did work to an extent. Yeah, yeah. Right. And really, I'm all up for encouraging people to do what works for them. I'm yeah. not here to push any particular philosophy or solution to anybody except explore everything, find the thing that works, and then keep doing that. And if it doesn't work, try something else. I know. it's true for, And we've talked about this because mm. I'm such a cynic that I don't think any placebo effect would work on me because I'm like, <laughs> vitamins are a have. This is all an industry. So, you know, this is the thing too, like, because Anna Sophia talked about that, mm. um, that, you know, she was spending all of this money on this alternative mm. stuff because she didn't mm. want to look at it. And then HRT is $5 for three months. Mm. Mm. And uh, for many people it works. Not everybody, but for many people it works. And that's exactly right. And you do need to look into your histories, etc., mm. and to calculate yeah. the risk. That's the thing because the risk is low, but, like, my friend has had a double mastectomy. So mm. she – and I was like, it's probably all right, but she's like, I just don't want to take that risk because yeah. I get that. And that's the thing. Yeah, but then I absolutely. feel sad for people like that who have so much less opportunities for help, but yet, yeah. you know, they know why and, yeah. and, and knowledge is power. Knowledge is power and also there are many things we can do as well as yep. HIT or supplements. I mean, just the fact that I can get myself back to sleep at night. With just meditation. Getting, yeah, through or sleep hygiene. So getting up and getting out of bed and taking myself to somewhere else in the house in the dark where it's a little bit cooler and I can just bore myself basically back to sleep. Right. See, yeah. I And it's so interesting because, well, because I've been taking amitriptyline, which mm. just actually recently seems to have stopped working, which is quite annoying. And then I get this really massive pain in the front of my leg. And I'm like, is that, like I went to the doctor. I was like, is this a blood clot? You know, mm. that's the thing about it. And I still haven't finished it, managed to figure it out. But it makes me sleep. And, mm. and I am someone that used to be a champion sleeper as well. Like I could sleep anywhere. Like when I was, mm. you know, dossing in flats mm. in London, <laughs> sleeping on the actually on the floor no yoga mat no cushions slept on the floor for a week in a London flat and and I could fall asleep on any bus Mm. like Eurobus tripping around Mm. and stuff like that and then for me it sort of started to change I don't know it's always around when I've got a show Mm. I'm premiering a show which is like fucking terrifying to be honest Mm. so you've written you've spent all this time writing it and then you're like I hope it's funny and then and also around my wedding because there's a lot in my Mm. head so I didn't sleep very well. So the amitriptyline is good for that. But I, I, because I, oh, I hate meditating. I hate it. Like, and I guess that's the thing. It's so boring. So you just mm. bore yourself back to sleep. And mm. the thing you must not do is pick up your phone. No, that's right. That's yeah. like the worst thing. I can read and I do, but so that's the opposite of boring. But yeah, I'm one thing I've started doing is charging my phone in a different room overnight. And that mm, has been definitely. a huge change mm, just from doing mm, that. And mm. and reading sends me straight to sleep. Yeah, reading is a great one too. I do do yeah. that. Mm. So you bore yeah. yourself in another room. And do you listen to things or do you actually have a thing in your head that you're going through? Oh, sometimes I do read and sometimes I just sit on the sofa with my eyes closed and just try not to think about anything. Yeah, which is for me very different. Like my brain, honestly, there's oh, a lot. Same. My it's husband's hard. always going <laughs> with yeah. my head. So yeah, it's something I've had to learn because I have a busy, active mind and yeah. find it hard to just you know turn off. Yeah, and you've got two. Ch- so now, how did your family unit react to all of this? 
Well, they were amazing. I mean, my partner was super supportive at the same time as probably being as worried and confused as I was. Mm. He has a very thirsty brain. So he was researching stuff and looking things up and we were talking all the time and he was coming to GP appointments with me oh. and, you know, being incredibly kind. That's and delightful. That was delightful. Yeah, yeah. I actually can't imagine how it might have been if I'd somehow managed to hide how, what I was really experiencing from him. It just, I can't imagine it. Which, you um, know, some women feel that they have to do. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. 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 So he was amazing. And also I wanted my friends and family to know as I was sort of working stuff out, what was going on so that they didn't worry unnecessarily that it was something else or, you yeah. know, something else like terminal. or Exactly. Yeah. You know, like really, it did feel catastrophic at the time, but it wasn't, uh, once I worked out that it was perimenopause, I could kind of go, this is what it is. There, are, mm. It's a stage, it's temporary, it's something I can get through. I'm seeing the right people. I've got the right support. I really so wanted them how, to understand that. Yeah, you can see how yeah. people ended up in asylums, you know. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so by being really open about it with them, they were able to actually give me what I needed. And sometimes right. that would mean an extra hug. I'd get up in the morning sometimes and just say, I just need a hug. Other days I might need to just go out and get a walk because I needed space, like just time on my own. Um, sometimes it would mean that they would empty the dishwasher more than usual, do some extra things that they would normally do little bits of, but they just did more. Or And is your partner good with that general mental load around the house anyway? Yes, I think I'm lucky. Yes, yeah. I think you are. I wouldn't <laughs> say it's 50-50 because I'm at home more. I right. work while my children are at school and then I'm with them. But things like, you know, there were times when I couldn't actually feel like I could walk down to my children's school and get home again. So he might do some school pickups or a neighbor might say, oh, you know, I can wow. pick kids up or drop kids off or whatever. There was a time when I couldn't drive while my heart was being explored. And while I was waiting to see a specialist, I couldn't actually drive because I didn't know if that feeling of fainting while I was driving was going to come back at any point. Yeah, yeah. with the kids in the car, etc. So when you have kids who go to swimming and, you know, after school activities and play dates and all that stuff, that's actually really challenging and inconvenient so I had an amazing group of friends and family who just gathered around me and said I'll take you to that appointment or I'll pick you up and we'll go to the supermarket I mean there were things really basic things like that not being able to drive was really hard oh, well because I couldn't I had just got my license when I was 15 and then I had my first mm. seizure so mm. I couldn't drive for a year exactly and it That's was tough. bullshit yeah it was real bullshit yeah. and yeah. now in Auckland it would be a nightmare so how old mm. are your children so they are now 12 and 15. So they were 8 and 11 at the time. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So they're now um, immersed in all of it and they will not be blindsided. No, they know more about, well, as much about menopause as I do, I think. Yeah, great. Great. I also had my, my in-laws, um, I even had them on board and they're great. amazing. But during school holidays and things, they just kind of came and scooped us up and took us home and, you know, looked after us and... We ended up watching the BBC documentary called The Truth About Menopause um, as a whole family. Was that with Davina? It was a generational experience. No, it was um, Mariella Frostrop. Oh, Frostrop, right. Okay. That's fantastic, watching it all yeah. And, you know, and yes, and bodies aren't taboo and there is no shame. So yeah. it's so crazy to me. I, get, I rant on about this, but the amount of shame that we've just had imbued into us by mm. the very vessel that creates life. People have been mm. sick of me saying this because I'm just banging mm. on about it. But it's like, what the fuck? So, yeah, so yeah. you're all sitting there doing that together. That's great. Yeah, and I then, mean, it wasn't the plan. The plan was that my partner and I would just watch this documentary together thinking, hey, cool, this is new information. And then next minute our kids join us from outside. They were playing and then just thought, oh, go and watch that. And then my father-in-law and mother-in-law, who in their late 70s at the time, and at the end my father-in-law said, well, that was fascinating. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't realized that my mother in law had been through menopause. Yeah. Yeah. And did she talk about it? She did then because she was really supportive of me and, you know, came to various appointments and totally was on my team. That's great. Yeah. Incredible. But no, they hadn't talked about it. So then we could talk about it. We're talking about it with an eight year old and an almost 80 year old. Yeah. 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 Great. It was beautiful. And, oh, yeah. And again, I come back to the, the women that have to face this by themselves. Like, imagine those. Women, there's poor women during a lockdown by themselves. They didn't have that hug mm. capacity and exactly. things like that doing exactly. all of this. Yeah, so I was incredibly lucky. Yeah. So just, I you know, lucky. sending immense amounts of love out to people like that. And hopefully yeah. people that were wondering what the fuck is happening to them. Are, if they're listening to this, they should have figured it out by now. But yes. Yeah. Right. There were some uh, speaking about best things and 
or the most useful things and least useful things. It's really good, I think, not to assume what somebody else needs. So everybody's experience is really different, right? Mm. And so it could be quite tempting to think, oh, I'll just do this or I'll just do that for someone. But actually, I think the best thing you can do is to ask someone, are you okay? Is there anything that you need? Yeah. And give them the opportunity to say, I need this or that. Yeah. Because sometimes, like I said, I needed a hug. Sometimes I needed space. Sometimes I needed quiet. Sometimes I needed to listen to music. I mean, there were just so many different things that you need in different moments. Do you have those moments still now or is that just all under control now? Uh, I would say most things are under control. I still have the odd night where I wake, but I can get myself back to sleep. I definitely need to manage stress really carefully and not take on as much as I might have five years ago. I think right. I'm much more conscious about what I can manage yeah. in terms of workload and projects. And it was like, you don't want to take on too much, but is it also just going, you know what, not giving any fucks to just go, This I have enough now, I don't need to prove myself to anybody, so I'm just mm. going to stop? I don't know about that. Okay. I just think there's a certain amount that my body and my mind can manage right now. I sort of have a really good sense of what that is, and when it feels like it goes over that, I know I have to just stop, say no to somebody, go to bed earlier, Yeah. look after myself better. Yeah, right. Yeah. And what do you think your trajectory on HRT is? It's really hard to know. Mm. It's really, really hard to know. So I had initially thought it'd be great if it's a couple of years and then I can, you know, start reducing the, the patches and the progesterone and then maybe I'll be through. I mean, I'm the average age of menopause is, you know, not having periods anymore is 51 or 52, depending on whose book you read. Yes, I, um, I have noticed that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking, well, I'm 50 and I've never wanted to be more average in my life than now because wouldn't it be great? In a year's time, I didn't have periods and I was through. But having said that, I talk to women who haven't had periods for years and they still have some symptoms. Yeah, hot flushes, hot flushes particularly I've heard. And is... sleep can be disrupted. So it's hard to know because everybody's different and I don't know what my body needs yeah. to do. And that's that sort of thing when you're terrified to go back to what it was. Yes, I'm really mm. not keen to go back. And so when I spoke to my specialist, how will I know when to sort of start testing things and, you know, reducing the patches? She just said that if I reduce them and those symptoms come back, then I know I'm not there yet. And right. to, to not feel bad about that and to just accept that that's how it is and to continue it for as long as I need to. And it's so interesting that there are some people like Peter Mathias who was mm. like, I will take this until I die. Yeah. So, yeah, and I don't know how – if she's tried – yeah, I wouldn't really get to that if she's, like, tried tapering down and stuff. And it's so mm. the different approaches to people like, this is working, I'm fine, and I think she credits it with the mojo that she still has, which is pretty phenomenal. But, yeah. you know, or is that, an, is that a placebo thing as well, ultimately, for that length mm. of time? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be taking something that I don't need. If my body doesn't need something, I don't want to be taking it. So yeah, exactly. My plan and is to – ultimately not need yeah. that support and it's I mean it's great that you can just you know you just t cut back a little bit you can cut them in half or something can't yeah. you and then just see how that goes and then go oh no I need to yeah keep going pretty and, it, and your body reacts very quickly to it to come back yeah 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 amazing you know a few days or weeks yeah right so yeah. I think I should add a new question to my questions which is what positives have you taken from this experience well I feel like I'm just getting started, really, now that I'm 50. Great. And now that I understand what I'm in, which is this amazing stage of life, really. I wouldn't be talking to you if I hadn't had that experience. Yeah. I wouldn't have started a Facebook group and learned about social media. I wouldn't be talking to workplaces and having an impact on, you know, all these people who didn't know anything or only knew a little bit or, knew, you know, knew something. I mean, the feedback from people that I get it's just hugely rewarding I just go well that's a positive yeah right and it's sort of this amazing opportunity to use all the skills that I've kind of built up over time through my work you know marketing comms writing building websites writing press releases talking to the media usually I'm putting other people in front of the media but now I'm stepping up and so it's kind of this amazing opportunity to join all those things together and make good yeah and just of, tell people yeah make good of something that was a really challenging time and to see the silver linings and go, well, here's a thing that isn't just my thing. It's something that yeah. heaps and heaps of people. And how has that been stepping in front of the camera when that wasn't what you, like, how has that been a confronting thing for you? Is it your natural place? Not at all. Oh, it's definitely not my natural place. <laughs> like I said, I'm very happy writing from my dining room table 
to tell stories about other people's ideas and other people's brands and other people's things. Right. And so I've had to grow into that idea that I might be someone who is asked to be on a podcast. Yes. Who's asked to speak at an event with, you know, hundreds of people or to chair a writer's festival event, which I'm doing at Verb. Oh, great. Up. Oh, fantastic. And with, was that with the Nickies or? With Nikki Bazant and Nikki Pellegrino, I'm chairing that event at Verb on the 6th of November. And I am hosting Showy Over His Live yeah. in Nelson with both of them as well. So it's, Exactly. I wonder if yeah. they, like, have they always gotten, you know, like they're, they're sort of, they come as a twosome now, which I don't know. Like no. I feel like the, the two of them together promoting it has just raised it that much more. I think I they think might so. be frustrated because they could have sold more books personally. <laughs> they were both of them, but there is something about that double act and the two different approaches because their books I are quite so. different. They that are different. Is, yeah. yeah. And I think there's a strength in that. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, I would say I am still growing into the thing that I'm doing, I would say. And how are you finding workplaces? Because obviously there's been some people Mm. saying, oh, we don't want people to know because they'll stop hiring us, et cetera, et cetera. So what Mm. has that been like? Because you've been going into corporate settings and speaking about it. Yeah, government organisations and businesses. And it's been amazing. And people have been incredibly curious and supportive. And they're doing it. They're talking about it up to I think about 10 I've done about 10 workplace hosted facilitated about 10 conversations down workplaces and the feedback's amazing fabulous there are many places and I'm not saying that to toot my own horn what I'm saying is amazing about it is that there are many places where people have a given permission and have a place and a time in their day to actually talk about this stuff or to learn about it and so for someone to say hey here's an hour or an hour and a half to learn some things feel enlightened and then be able to ask questions of somebody is it's gold for people and how many men come to these yeah so I had a conversation with Inland Revenue recently online it was a virtual talk 270 people tuned in and 12 of them were men right and I mean I understand that but it's frustrating in a way because you know all men no women Yeah. yeah Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's my line is it's a it's not just a woman's issue. It's an everybody issue. But I think yeah, we need to start somewhere, right? Oh, absolutely. I can understand why some people might think this is a woman's thing. And they don't want to feel like they're getting in the way or taking up space, etc. Taking yeah, up yeah. space or just making people feel uncomfortable. But of course, the whole idea is to make people feel comfortable. I know, and it's amazing how often men are like, you know, around anything mm. like that. So, mm. but yeah, I mean, maybe a. A talk specifically focused on men for men would be an interesting. That would be one. good. Yeah, that would be good. But I had really nice feedback from from men in the session saying how great it is to be informed. Yeah, and like when I did my little speech to Parliament, uh, which was hilarious. Um, yeah, there was I can't remember there weren't very many, but there were a couple, and they were like, "Oh my god, I had no idea." So yeah, yeah. I mean, from the men I've spoken to, because I do think they get a bit of a bad rep sometimes for this stuff. Yeah, I have spoken to numerous men who absolutely want to do the right thing by the people in their lives. Yep, at home our, our partners both, for example. Yep. Yeah, and in workplace. I've had people say, you know, thanks for having this conversation because their former partner had been through perimenopause. He felt like he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. If he said something, it was the wrong thing. If he didn't say something, it wasn't enough. And mm. he wished that he had known what it was and how he could have managed that. And he sort of said it in a way that made me think, maybe things would have worked out differently. Yeah. 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 It's like Penny Lancaster and Rod Stewart, him, her throwing saucepans at him and him saying that all men should have menopause lessons. But, yeah, it must be very difficult because, you know, if a man ever says to you, and it was at that time of the month, you'd, like, punch him in the face. And it's sort of like the the other side of that. So, yes, they have to be careful. Yeah. And I've also had, I've had a younger guy ask me, basically his partner isn't in perimenopause yet, but he wants to be prepared. And he asked me the other day in a talk, what could he do or say now? So they could start that conversation. So when they get to that place, if she does need support, how could he be the best person? That's an adorable question. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Oh, my God, what a charming partner. That's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we need to be careful. Well, we just need to make sure that we are inclusive and encouraging and make it easy for people of all genders and all ages to get the information they need and to give them the chance to be useful and helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And if we start the conversation with, you know, 
young men at school, et cetera. Like mm. what, the way we used to divide, I don't know, they still do that, divide us into boys and girls for sex education and stuff. No, like, well, at my kids' school, they definitely uh, learn all, all of that stuff together and they're learning about it from age five or six. That's See, that's so good. When you think about that fact that mm. we're all taken away and like, mm-hmm. oh, it's shameful, the boys are going to talk about mm. ejaculation mm. and the girls are going to talk about, you know, and that, that – as if those two things were similar for a start, you know, yeah. like, but that's what happened. You get the wet dream talk, we get the period talk. It's mm. like, yeah, wow, that's instilled right from the beginning that mm. this is about fun and then even though obviously premature and obviously and I don't want to belittle anybody that has erectile issues, mm. but, yeah, when you imbue that from a really young age, it's like, mm. oh, right, no wonder. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Thank there's God a lot changing. Of, yeah, there are a lot of things that could be done and I would love them all to happen tomorrow to make it all so much easier for everybody. So, you know, our kids will be learning about it at school just as the part of, the, you know, the cycle of life. Yeah, yeah. They and I feel that we're going to be the last generation to be blindsided by it, especially I if we have so. anything to do with it. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if our tamariki were learning about it just at home and at school, if our GPs were all up to the same speed and some are doing an amazing job and I totally, yeah. totally into that. But if that was just across the board, Yep. Uh, if workplaces knew how to support people through a tricky patch. Yeah. And if there were posters on GP notice boards and I would love to receive a letter from my GP. Yeah. Really, in hindsight, probably in my late 30s, early 40s, like we get for cervical screening and mammograms to say, hey, just to let you know, here's some stuff that could happen. This is yeah. a normal, inevitable stage of life. It's a hormonal transition. It's nothing to be fearful of or ashamed of or apologize for this is a thing. If you need support, talk to somebody. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would love that to be the norm instead of this ambulance at the bottom of the cliff kind of thinking at the moment. I would love everything to be far more preventative. Yeah, Mm. yeah. So Mm. is there anything else that you would like to talk to around menopause or we've covered quite a lot? We've covered a lot of ground, haven't we? Yes, we have. We have. Um, I mean, so many of your other guests have covered so much as well that I feel like I'll just be doubling up. You can double. The thing is, people dip into podcasts and listen to who they want to and who's interested. True. So, true. you know, not everyone's listened to all of them. Absolutely. So you do you. So, well, one thing is the the most useful and the least useful things. I'd quite like to touch on that. Yep. The most useful things for people just asking me how they could help or what I needed. I think that was really amazing. Mm-hmm. Older friends or anybody actually, reminding me that this was just a temporary phase of life. This wasn't the new me forever. That was really useful. Just that there would be a solution. There was a time when I thought I couldn't see an end. I just thought this is just how it's going to be. But someone, an older friend, kept reminding me there will be an answer. You don't know what it is yet, but there will be an answer. And that was that gave me a lot of hope, which was really crucial when I was feeling really low. And I think making people feel like you're going to stick by them, that just because somebody's going through a rough patch or that they you know they're coming to the end of their reproductive lives that we need to continue to make people feel like they're of value they're not invisible yeah they're actually better than ever yeah yeah with all that accumulated years of knowledge that they can then apply in the workplace yeah and the least useful things were people who were dismissive or minimized what I was experiencing yeah so I had one health practitioner who will remain unnamed who suggested that no one had ever died of menopause and that was after I'd had a couple of panic attacks and I was feeling like that was not the best thing to say in hindsight I can see they were trying to maybe give me some perspective but it had the wrong effect yeah you're belittling your feelings like oh well it's not like you're terminal shut up yeah yeah Mm. like there were bigger problems to Mm. be dealing with yeah so that wasn't useful and people saying oh you must be too young it can't be hormones can't be perimenopause because you're too young. Well, I was 46 and any time really in your 40s is quite common. Mm-hmm. Or people saying, oh, you don't need HRT. You can get through this with all the other things that, you know, that yeah. I'd learned and had success with. So, or people saying, oh, talking about this, you know, that could backfire, talking about it. In public. You know, with my clients or wow. in public. Yeah. Right, or okay. in a workplace. So, yeah, because I didn't have any shame or embarrassment around talking about it. And I just thought this is something I need to tell my clients because I'm not able to work right now. Mm, mm. I didn't have any issues with that. I talked about it as if I had would have had appendicitis or a broken leg. I just said, hey, I'm not well at the moment for this reason and I'm going to need a couple of weeks off to basically wait for HRT to have some effect. That was where I was at at that point. And they were super supportive and really kind. So right. yeah, those things, yeah, just do those things. Okay, great. 
Yeah. Cool. And so now do you have an out-of-the-box fun fact for us? Well, my fun fact is that a couple of years ago, I read in the New York Times, so it must be true, (laughs) that the Arabic dictionary redefined menopause as the age of renewal instead of the age of despair. Right. And I really like that. The idea also in Chinese culture or traditional Chinese medicine, the idea of a second spring. Yeah. So I just think that's a great thing if it's true because there are so many negative connotations around the stage of life and there doesn't need to be. Absolutely. It really is the, it's not the end. It's the end of one stage of our lives and it's the beginning of another stage of our lives. So let's just get on with that and enjoy that and make the most of that. Yeah, I think especially because, you know, our life expectancy is like so much longer now that Mm. we can sit here and look, you know, I've got friends, I've got a good friend, she's 92, you know, and you're Mm. like, this was such a long time ago for her. So, and then, and we're supposed to have been written off for this whole part of our lives. And I think it's quite good for people like us as well, who's self-employed and things like that, Mm. that we can just keep pushing. I don't, nobody can tell me I'm invisible to go away because I'll be like, fuck you, I'm doing another show. So, and you're Mm. doing all of this as well. So I think that's what's empowering for us to do that. But I I still feel it, but it's good to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I don't have plans to become invisible. Neither do I. Neither. I think that's an excellent way to end. We have no plans to be invisible. We're here. We're menopausal or sort of, and we're proud. So hooray. Yes. I was going to say we're queer because that just feels like it goes with that. But I am not queer <laughs> and I don't want to appropriate anybody else's culture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, well, thank yeah. you very much for your all that you do and for answering my texts at all yeah. times of the day. Yes, and, and hopefully I'm going to be in Wellington in November and we can actually like have a coffee. I don't drink martinis, but we can have a no, coffee. No, neither yeah. do I really. So yeah. um, a mocktail would do. A mocktail. I know. And I love this because there's a whole thing about you should cut down on an alcohol. Oh, I know you've posted yeah. quite a few things, but look, it was just alliteration. It was, but I think it's great. It's a good, it's catchy. It's catchy. It's catchy. Yeah, it's catchy. Okay, great. Well, I'll see you when I see you. I'll see you soon. So that was the very marvelous, educational, passionate advocate, Sarah Connor. And I honestly think her relationship with her body is inspired. Hardly anybody in these podcasts has said, oh, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I never had any shame about that. Like, that's actually amazing. And we should celebrate her for that and replicate it. Huzzah. Head to Menopause Over Martini's Facebook page to sign up for more group wisdom, information, chats, and solidarity. But remember, it's public. So don't start ranting on about your burning vulva, then being surprised when Uncle Barry likes your comment. Another fun fact is that the word in Latin for ant is formica. Or formica? I don't know. I looked it up after that conversation about formication. There is sort of a connection between ants and my dining room table, but you can look that up. But rest assured, there is one. So, okay, shall we ovarians? So much news this week. Again, let's celebrate that Eutrogestin has been fully funded, micronized progesterone. I actually chatted to Sarah in the morning, and then in the afternoon that news was announced after we've been discussing it, so that was fantastic. Also, sorry, you snooze, you lose, but Showy Ovaries Live in the Nelson Festival has sold out a month in advance, so that's very fabulous. I am brewing up other ideas for live shows in places, though, so watch out for those. Still plenty of tickets to see Olive Copperbottom in Palmerston North from October 1st to 9th. An opening is a fundraiser for the Palmerston North Women's Health Collective, so look out for that. Anyways, sign up at my Patreon to support this podcast. Like me on the socials and stay juicy everybody. Ka kite. Penny Ashton signing off for Ruahinatangi Hahaki. Showy ovaries. Ovaries.